Good afternoon. Here we go again on the road of pathology and me, Alexander Bondarenko. I would like to continue our journey on this road and our next step today is a hemodynamic disorders. Very important topic and uh, I guess the importance of that I shouldn't approve anyway. I would like to say that the cardiovascular disease is the most important cause of morbidity and mortality in Western society. So now uh, it was it's estimated around you no know, one hundred million of people in the United States and in uh, one or more forms of cardiovascular disease in approximately one-third of uh, 40% of all death. Um, these diseases primarily affect one of three major components of the cardiovascular system, the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood itself. We will discuss about them particularly next semester. Anyway, no. For simplicity, disorders that affect each component um, of the cardiovascular system are considered separately, recognizing that disturbances affecting one component often lead to adaptations and abnormalities involving others. Brain will focus on disorders of hemodynamics, like edema, effusions, Congestion and uh, hyperemia, shock. Uh, also, uh, I would like to provide an overview of disorders of abnormal bleeding and clotting, as bleeding, thrombosis, and embolism, as well as DIC syndrome as a systemic uh, form of this disturbances of uh, hemocoagulation. So, let's start with edema and effusions. Disorders that perturb cardiovascular, renal, or hepatic function are often marked by accumulation of fluid in tissues. Uh, we call it edema, or, you know, plethora, or body cavities, uh, effusions. You see, on this schematic, and that under the normal uh, circumstances, uh, the tendency of vascular hydrostatic pressure to push water and salts out of capillaries into the interstitial space is nearly balanced by the tendency of plasma colloid osmotic pressure to pull water and salts back into vessels. There is usually a small net movement of fluid into the interstitium, but this drains into lymphatic vessels and ultimately returns to the bloodstream via the thoracic duct, keeping the tissues more or less dry. Uh, so then you see that elevated hydrostatic pressure uh, or decreased uh, colloid osmotic, osmotic pressure disrupts this equilibrium and results in increased movement of fluid out of vessels. If the net rate of fluid movement exceeds the rate of lymphatics, lymphatic drainage of fluid again accumulates. Within tissues, the result is edema, and if a cirrhosal, um, surfaces involved fluid may accumulate within the adjacent body cavity as an effusion. So, uh, mm, edema fluids and effusions uh, may be inflammatory and uh, non inflammatory. Inflammation related edema uh, and infusions we will discuss uh, in appropriate topic, topic uh, to inflammation. Uh, today, we will discuss only about non 
inflammatory types of edema infusions. And uh, from this point, now you have to realize that there is the difference between the effusions um, associated with the inflammation, we call it exudate, and uh, effusions, uh, which is associated with non inflammatory disorders, we call it transudate. Exudate and transudate. Try to memorize that. Uh, so, as I already told you, the non inflammatory edema and effusions are protein poor fluids and they call transudates. Non inflammatory edema and effusions are common in many diseases, including heart failure. Liver failure, uh, renal disease, and uh, severe nutritional disorders. So uh, now I would like to discuss uh, various causes of the edema. So uh, mm, let's. Uh, discuss about them by the numbers. First, the increased hydrostatic pressure. Uh, that's mainly caused by disorders that impair venous return. If the impairment is localized, for example, in case of the deep venous thrombosis in the lower extremity, then the resulting edema is confined to the affected part. Conditions leading to systemic increases in venous pressure, like congestive heart failure, are understandably associated with more widespread edema. Second, uh, reduced plasma osmotic pressure. Under no normal circumstances, albumin accounts for almost half of the total plasma protein. It follows that conditions leading to inadequate synthesis of incre or increased loss of albumin from the circulation and are common causes of reduced plasma and body pressure. Reduced albumin synthesis occurs mainly in severe liver disease, uh, like end-stage cirrhosis, uh, in case of protein malnutrition. An important cause of albumin mm, loss is the nephrotic syndrome uh, in which albumin leaks into the urine through abnormally permeable glomerular capillaries. Regardless of course, reduced plasma and osmotic pressure um, leads to a stepwise mm, fashion to edema, reduced intravascular volume, renal hyperperfusion, um, a secondary hyperallosteronism. So, again, uh, to the previous um, slide, you see that's on the systems which are involved to this process. Um, sodium and water retention. The next. Mm. cause of the edema development. Now, in, this, in this case, increased salt retention with obligate retention of uh, associated water uh, causes both increased hydrostatic pressure due to intravascular fluid volume expansion and diminished vascular colloid osmotic pressure. Lymphatic obstruction due to infection or neoplasia, uh, trauma, fibrosis, mm, they, all of them, they can disrupt lymphatic drainage and uh, impair of clearance of interstitial fluid, resulting in lymphedema in the affected part of the body. A dramatic example seen in parasitic thiasis. Uh, uh, I will show you a slide later. Well, now, uh, let's discuss about different morphological forms of 
edema. First, that's subcutaneous edema. Um, um, could be diffuse or more conspicuous in regions with high hydrostatic pressures. It's uh, distributions. Mm, distribution is often influenced by gravity. For example, it appears in the legs, then standing and the sacrum when recumbent. Uh, that's feature termed dependent edema. Finger pressure over markedly uh, edematous mm, tissue, edematous subcutaneous tissue displays the interstitial fluid and leaves the depression, a sign called uh, pitting edema. Um, periorbital edema, that's a type of uh, subtype of edema resulting from renal dis dysfunction. Mm, on, it, it may often uh, appear mm, initially in parts of the body containing loose connective tissue, like eyelids. Um, pulmonary edema, oh, sorry, mm, that's the lymphedema I said wanted to tell you. That's exactly caused by uh, filariasis, and uh, you see this asymmetric edema with injury on the one leg. Uh, it provides the symptom that we call elephantiasis. In the pulmonary edema, mm, the lungs are often two or three times the normal weight. Um, the section in yells for the uh, blood tinged uh, fluid, a mixture of air, edema, and extravasated red cells. Brain edema can be localized or generalized depending on the nature and extent of the pathologic process of injury. Uh, the swollen. Okay, that's here. See the microscopic appearance of that? Uh, the other space is filled with the pinky fluid, that's the protein rich fluid, and some air bubbles also present here. Uh, brain edema can be localized or generalized depending on the nature and extent of the pathologic process of injury. Mm, like this, the swollen brain exhibits a narrowed sulci and distended gyri, uh, which are compressed by the unyielding skull, and sometimes it may lead to the herniation of the cerebellum into foramen magnum that consequently may lead to the uh, compression of the stem, brain stem. And see the microscopic appearance of the cerebral edema um, uh, reveals the presence of spaces between the mm, interstitial um, tissue of the brain and the vessels. Fusions involving the mm, uh, peritoneal cavity, hydroperitoneum or ascites, uh, pleural cavi cavity, hydrothorax, are the pericardial cavity, hydropericardium, are common in a wide range of clinical settings. Transudative effusions are typically protein poor, translucent, and straw colored. An exception are peritoneal effusions um, called um, kilos infusions. It's like, uh, caused by lymphatic blockage. Uh, well, this is the morphological feature of the summary of them. The edema, which appears grossly as the tissue spelling, and microscopically with clearing and separation of the extracellular matrix in subtle cell, cellular swelling. Uh, effusions as a hydrothorax, hydropericardium, hydroperitoneum ascites. And you see the difference between the transudative effusions, which are protein-poor, translucent, and straw-colored, 
and exudative infusions. Hyperemia and congestion both uh, stem from increased blood volumes within tissues. Hyperemia, uh, that's an active process. Uh, then the arterial dilation increases blood flow. And congestion is a passive one. Reduced venous outflow due to systemic, like in case of heart failure or localized venous thrombosis um, causes. Signs and causes of hyperemia. Uh, it could be erythema, uh, like redness of the affected tissue due to inflammation, low air pressure, vasoactive mediators like hormones, chemicals, increased metabolism and work of tissue, or um, it could be caused by edema in case of inflammation due to increased permeability of the capillaries. So, example, that's the conjunctival uh, hyperemia, which is associated with the conjunctivitis, that's the inflammation of the uh, conjunctiva. And you see the microscopically the dilated uh, capillaries you know, caused by inflammation. The inflammatory cells uh, you may see also in the interstitium, uh, plenty of them. Congestion. This is liver with chronic passive congestion and um, some areas of hemorrhagic necrosis. So you see that central areas are red um, and slightly depressed compared with the surrounding 10 viable parenchyma forming a nutmeg liver so called because it resembles the cut surface of a nutmeg. Microscopically you see the central lobular necrosis is degenerating hepatocytes and hemorrhage. You see the red uh, color of the um, collected RBCs here. Mm. Also, on the periphery of the lobule, you may find the mm, fatty changes. In the good example of the local congestion. Uh, which is mm, embracing only the liver, uh, the whole liver, or just the lobe of the liver. That's the bad carry syndrome, which is associated with the local uh, thrombosis of the mm, hepatic uh, veins. Again, in this case, we may observe the um, acute or chronic venous congestion. Uh, in the lung, the chronic venous congestion appears um, um, and, okay, it's often caused by congestive heart failure. Um, you may see the septa uh, thickened and um, fibrotic, and the alveoli often, often contain numerous hemosiderin laden macrophages called heart failure cells. Um, for example, but in case of acute pulmonary congestion, it exhibits only the um, um, edema and focal alveolar hemorrhage. Grossly, uh, the lungs transform into so-called mm, lungs with brown induration. That's the combination of uh, the diffuse fibrosis of lungs and uh, uh, accumulation of hemosidrophages. In other organs, chronic venous congestion may lead to the so-called cyanotic induration, like in the spleen together with splenum megaly or a cyanotic induration of the of kidneys. And for sure the best comparison in our life that's the congestion on the road, traffic congestion. Almost exactly due to the same 
um, via the same mechanisms. Presuming uh, congestion as a general sign, general gross morphological sign as the congested tissues take on a dusky reddish blue color. We call it cyanosis in contrast to the hyperemia then we're talking about erythema. Uh, acute pulmonary congestion um, exhibits endorchal alveolar capillaries, alveolar septor, septal edema and focal intraalveolar hemorrhage. Chronic pulmonary congestion uh, reveals sept septa which are thickened and fibrotic and alveoli contain numerous uh, hemocytophages. Acute hepatic congestion uh, demonstrates um, distension of the central vein and sinusoids. Uh, also some signs of ischemic necrosis of central lobular hepatocytes and uh, periportal hepatocytes develop fatty change. Chronic passive hepatic congestion grossly demonstrates the central lobular regions red-brown, slightly depressed and accentuated against the surrounding zones of uncongested tan liver, so-called nutmeg liver, and microscopically uh, demonstrates the um, centri lobular hemorrhage, hemocydrine laden macrophages, um, and very variable degrees of hepatocytes repout and necrosis. Hemostasis. As the precisely orchestrated process uh, involving platelets, clotting factors, uh, and uh, endothelium that occurs at the site of vascular injury and culmin culminates in the formation of a blood clot, which serves to prevent uh, or limit the extent of bleeding. See the general uh, sequence of events leading to hemostasis at the site of vascular injury. You may see on this image this first the arteriolar vasoconstriction due to the injury, then primary hemostasis, the formation of the platelet plug, uh, then uh, secondary uh, hemostasis, the beginning of deposition of fibrin, and uh, clot stabilization and resorption. So the polymerase, polymerized fibrin and platelet aggregate and, uh, and then that's aggregate, already aggregated and that are the goal contraction to form solid um, more stable uh, blood clot well uh, more precisely uh, you will discuss about the um, characteristics and features of uh, hemostasis on the pathophysiology course. Uh, I would like to uh, continue our lecture with the morphological appearance of the consequences uh, of the lack um, in the hemostasis. And I want to um, shed the light on the hemorrhagic disorders. As the disorder is associated with abnormal bleeding, inevitably stem from primary or secondary def defects in vessel walls, platelets, or coagulation factors, all of which must function properly to ensure hemostasis. The uh, presentation of abnormal bleeding varies widely. Uh, at one end of the spectrum, a massive bleeds associated with the ruptures of um, large vessels, like the cerebral artery in this case. Um, these catastrophic events simply overwhelm hemostatic mechanism and are often uh, fatal, like in case of hemorrhaging stroke, you see again, with the injury of the brain. Uh, diseases associated with sudden massive hemorrhage include aortic dissection and the setting of Marfan syndrome, um, aortic abdominal aneurysm, myocardial infarction, uh, could be complicated by rupture of aorta or heart. At the other end of the spectrum are subtle defects and clotting that only become evident under conditions of hemostatic, hemostatic stress, such as surgery, childbirth, 
dental procedures, menstruation, or trauma. Among the most common causes uh, of mild bleeding tendencies are inherited defects in von Willebrand factor, aspirin consumption, and uremia, renal failure. The latter alters bladder function through uncertain mechanism between these extreme slight deficiencies of coagulation factors like hemophilias and others, which are usually inherited and lead to severe bleeding disorders in, if untreated. Additional specific examples of disorders associated with abnormal bleeding are discussed, will be discussed throughout the uh, lecture, I will show you. Um, and uh, you see over here the samples of that test. Uh, Take your hemorrhages in the colonic mucosa as the sequence of the thrombocytopenia. Uh, this is the um, ulcer, peptic ulcer in the stomach with the bleeding. And uh, this type of hemorrhage is developing due to the erosion, chemical erosion of the um, arteries or other large vessels which lay in the wall of the stomach. Uh, another type of the uh, hemorrhages you can observe here, that's the um, fragment of skin with different types of uh, hemorrhages uh, per diapodesis. So you see the diapodesis uh, rupture of the vessel and the erosion of vessel as three different uh, pathogenetical uh, mechanisms of the bleeding. So in this case that skin with different types of uh, mm, small diapodetic um, hemorrhages like take there, the small ones like dot like um, hemorrhages like here, uh, purpura and ecchymosis. And in the particular sites of our body we can find uh, other different types of specific types of uh, hemorrhages of bleeding. For example, hematoma uh, means uh, uh, restricted area filled with the blood clot. Uh, this uh, restricted yielded area basically uh, yielded by um, anatomical structures like bones uh, or um, ligaments, um, you know, capsular serous uh, layers or others. So in this case there's epidural hematoma in the skull and uh, in this case it's uh, restricted by the um, bone uh, of the cranium and uh, cranial bone and the uh, dura mater. Sometimes we also can find so-called subdural hematoma. In this case, subdural hematoma is restricted by the dura matter and the pia matter. Uh, intracerebral hematoma appears within the um, brain tissue, like this. That's hemorrhagic stroke the large one, and another type of uh, hemorrhage which is associated with the um, bleeding in the brain, that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. In this case uh, we see the distribution of blood uh, which is uh, restricted by the uh, tunica arachnoidea. So, uh, Resuming this uh, part of our lecture, the hemorrhagic disorders, that's disorders which are associated with abnormal bleeding, uh, inevitably stem from primary or secondary defects in vessel walls, 
platelets are coagulation factors, all of which must function properly to ensure hemostasis. I just repeat this statement and uh, uh, here I want to specify some points. Uh, you see there are massive bleeds uh, which are associated with ruptures or erosion of large vessels uh, with the mm, most prominent examples like aortal aneurysm rupture, myocardial infarction rupture, uh, aka hemopericardium. Bleeding from eroded vessels, like in case of peptic ulcer of stomach, or due to trauma, and again we have deal with the rupture of the vessels in case of hematorx or hemoperitoneum. Uh, another big uh, cause of the hemorrhagic disorders is the defects in clotting. Basically, they are associated with the um, di diapedetic uh, bleeding, diapedetic uh, hemorrhages, hemorrhages per diapedesis. Uh, there's the defects of primary hemostasis, for example. Uh, in this case, uh, we have deal with von Willebrand disease. Uh, at that case, we can observe the bleeds in skin or mucosal membranes. Uh, if they are mm, up to one or two millimeter in diameter, we call them petechia. Um, more uh, than three uh, millimeter, uh, that's the purpura. And uh, up to one or two centimeters, uh, that's the ecchymosis. Sometimes we simply call them bruises. Um, then uh, another specific types of bleeding that's like nasal bleeding we call it epistaxis um, gastrointestinal bleeding um, menorrhagia secondary hemostasis disorders for example hemophilia in that case we can observe so-called hemarthrosis the accumulation of blood um, in other words hematoma uh, restricted with the mm, joint membranes, the synovial membranes. Soft tissue hemorrhages, uh, also related to the secondary hemostasis disorder, and generalized defects involving small vessels like palpable purpura and ecchymosis. Um, in both purpura and ecchymosis, the volume of extravasated blood is sufficient to create a palpable mass of blood known as hematoma. So they could be developed due to systemic vasculitis, amyloidosis, and scurvy. Uh, and now let's discuss about the basic principles and the defects of um, hemostasis. Uh, over here you can see the very famous um, schematic uh, which is um, explaining the mechanism of thrombosis. You should know that the primary abnormalities that lead to thrombosis are endothelial injury, uh, stasis or turbulent blood flow, uh, then uh, hypercoagulability of the blood. And all of these uh, factors are included into so-called Virkov triad. Uh, thrombosis is one of the scourges of modern man because it underlies the most serious and common forms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so, I just want to focus briefly on causes and consequences of this. And uh, of every time then we will discuss about uh, cardiovascular diseases in next semester, uh, this uh, part of the basic general pathology will be very important for understanding of the pathogenesis of the cardiovascular disease. That's why now that's very, very important point. No, first of all, endothelial injury. Endothelial injury leading to platelet activation almost inevitably underlies thrombus formation in the heart, the arterial circulation, where the higher rates of blood flow impede 
cloud formation. Well, thrombi can develop anywhere in the cardiovascular system and vary in size and shape depending on the involved site and the underlying cause. Arterial or cardiac thrombi usually uh, begin at sites of turbulence um, or endothelial injury, whereas venous thrombi characteristically occur at sites of stasis. Thrombi are focally attached to underlying vascular surface, particularly at the point of initiation. Uh, from here, arterial thrombi tend to grow retrograde while we know thrombi extend in direction of blood flow. Thus, both propagate toward the heart. The propagating portion of a thrombus is often poorly attached and therefore prone to fragmentation and embolization. We will discuss about that later. Uh, thrombi often have grossly and microscopically apparent laminations called lines of tan which are pale platelet and fibrin deposits alternating with darker red cell rich layers such laminations signify that the thrombus has formed in flowing blood their presence can therefore distinguish antemortem clots from the bland non-laminated clots that occur postmortem so you can see them here. Uh, thrown by occurring in heart chambers or, or in the aortic lumen are designated as mural thrown by. Abnormal myocardial contraction, arrhythmias, dilated cardio, um, cardiomyopathy, um, for example, or myocardial infarction as well as endomyocardial injury, like in case of myocarditis, promotes cardiac mural thrombi, while ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque and aneurysmal dilation are the precursors of aortic thrombi. Uh, you should know that arterial thrombi are frequently occlusive, so the most common sites in decreasing order of frequency are the coronary, cerebral and femoral arteries. They typically consist of the uh, friable meshwork or platelets, fibrin, red cells and degenerating leukocytes. Although these are usually superimposed on the ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, other vascular injuries like vasculitis or trauma may be underlying cause. Uh, in other hand, venous thrombosis, or mm, they call it phlebothrombosis, is almost invariably occlusive with the uh, thrombus forming a long luminal cast because uh, these thrombi form the sluggish venous circulation uh, they tend to contain more mm, enmeshed red cells and relatively a uh, few platelets and they are um, therefore known as red or stasis thrombi we know thrombi are firm, focally attached to vessel wall and contain lines of zan features that zan features that help distinguish them from postmortem clots. Uh, you see, uh, the postmortem clots can sometimes be mistaken from antemortem venous thrombi. However, clots that form after death are gelatinose. Um, and have dark red dependent portion where red cells have settled by gravity and yellow chicken fat upper portion so that's very distinguishable 
features. Um, the veins of the lower extremities are most commonly involved. That's like 90% of cases of the venous thrombosis. Uh, however, upper extremities, uh, periprostatic uh, venous plexus, or the ovarian or periuterine veins also can develop venous thrombi. Under special circumstances, they can also occur in dural sinuses, portal vein, or hepatic vein, as we discussed before about uh, specific syndrome in the liver, right? But here it's syndrome. Uh, the specific thrombi of heart uh, we call uh, vegetations. Uh, Blood-borne bacteria or fungi can adhere to previously damaged valves or can directly cause valve damage, uh, like in case of infective endocarditis. Or sometimes uh, we can observe the sterile vegetations. They could be developed in, on non-infected valves. Uh, with, in persons with uh, hypercoagulation syndromes, uh, so-called non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. And sometimes we can find uh, sterile viricose endocarditis, so-called Liebman Sachs endocarditis, that can occur in the persons with the systemic lupus erythematosus. So, um, Briefly resuming the thrombosis, thrombus development usually is related to one or more components of the group of pride, that's endothelial injury caused by toxins, hypertension, inflammation, or metabolic products. They basically associated with endothelial activation and changed in endothelial gene expression that favor coagulation. Abnormal blood flow like stasis or turbulence due to aneurysm, atherosclerotic plaques, um, etc. Hypercoagulability, sorry, uh, either primary or secondary. Um, fate of thrombi, that's another interesting uh, discussion that's about uh, the different stages of that. If a patient survives the initial thrombosis, uh, the ensuing days to weeks thrombi undergo some combination of um, the following four events. First, as propagation, thrombi accumulate additional platelets and fibrin. We discussed about that earlier. I told you about the propagation of thrombi in both venous and anterior, and all of them uh, tending towards the heart. Embolization, uh, we'll discuss about that later. Mm, dissolution. Dissolution is the result of fibrinolysis, which can lead to the rapid shrinkage and total disappearance of recent thrombi. In contrast, the extensive fibrin deposition and cross-linking in all the thrombi renders them more resistant to lysis. This distinction explains why uh, therapeutic administration of fibrinolytic agents is generally effective only when given during the first few hours of a thrombotic event. Uh, and uh, later, that's uh, organization and uh, recanalization. Uh, you see that all the thrombi become organized by the ingrowth of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. Uh, in this low power view, you see the thrombosed artery stained for elastic tissue. Uh, the original lumen is delineated by the internal elastic lamina, these arrows, um, and totally filled with organized thrombus. Now it's punctuated by several recanalized endothelium lined channels. So that's species over here. So that's organization and recanalization. 
continued recanalization may convert uh, thrombus into a smaller mass of connective tissue that becomes incorporated into a vessel wall. Eventually, with remodeling and contraction of the mesenchymal elements, uh, only fibrous lump may remain to mark the original thrombus. Occasionally, the centers of thrombi may undergo enzymatic digestion, uh, presumably as a result of the release of lysosomal enzymes from trapped lacocytes and platelets in the setting of bacteremia. Such thrombi may become infected, producing an inflammatory mass that erodes and weakens the vessel wall. If unchecked, this may result in the, for example, mycotic aneurysm. Our next point of the discussion, that's embolism. And you should know the definition that embolus is a detached intravascular solid, liquid, or gaseous mass that is carried by the blood from its point of origin to a distant site where it often causes tissue dysfunction or infarction. So over here you see the ambulus from a lower extremity, deep venous thrombosis that was origin, uh, lodged at pulmonary artery branch point. That's very serious uh, outcome that may lead to death. So see here you may observe the pathogenesis of its development from the point of origin. So finally that's lodged into the bifurcation of pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary trunk, the right ventricle, uh, right atrium, vena cava inferior, and somewhere from the low extremities, uh, we see the delivery of this uh, thrombo thromboembolus in this case, and finally lodging that into the bifurcation and in such a way that may abstract uh, bilaterally both um, pulmonary arteries. That's again the examples of the pulmonary thromboembolism. That's the grossly and uh, microscopically. Uh, most pulmonary emboli 60 or 80 to 80 percent they are clinically silent because they are small uh, with time they become organized and uh, incorporated into the vascular wall in some cases organization of the thromboembolus lived, leaves behind a delicate bridging fibrous web sometimes you may observe sudden death right failure core pulmonary uh, or cardiovascular collapse occurs then emboli obstruct 60% or more of the pulmonary circulation like in this case. Embolic obstruction of medium-sized arteries with subsequent vascular rupture can result in pulmonary hemorrhage and infarction of lungs. Usually doesn't cause pulmonary infarction because the lung is supplied by both pulmonary arteries and the bronchial arteries. Uh, but if it happens, we may observe so called red infarction. Embolic obstruction of small, uh, small and arterial pulmonary branches often does produce hemorrhage or infarction. And multiple emboli over time may cause pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure. Another type of embolism, so now let's discuss about the type of embolism. So uh, amniotic fluid embolism, it's very serious complication. Uh, amniotic fluid embolism is the fifth most common cause of maternal mortality worldwide. It accounts for roughly 10% of maternal death in Western countries. 
um, and may lead to the permanent neurologic deficit in as many as uh, 85% of survivors. So, uh, see, amniotic fluid embolism, uh, that's ominous complication of labor and the immediate postpartum period. Um, that's like, example, in case of injury of the uterine um, during the like cesarean uh, uh, dissection, there is a risk of entrapping of the parts of the amnion, amniotic fluid with the par fragments of tissue into the vessels of the you know, vena cava inferior system, like pelvic uh, veins. And then, so they are just could be delivered first to the lungs, to the pulmonary circulation, and uh, then later they can lead to the uh, diffuse alveolar damage. It's uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Fat embolism, that's another important type of uh, um, embolism. They combined into fat and bone marrow embolism. You see here the microscopic fat globules. Uh, this associated uh, hematopoietic bone marrow. Uh, they could be found in the pulmonary vasculature after fractures of long bones, so rarely in the setting of soft tissue trauma and burns. Presumably, these injuries rupture uh, vascular sinusoid and marrow of small venules, allowing marrow or adipose tissue to herniate into the vascular space and travel to the lung. Fat and marrow emboli are very common incidental findings after vigorous cardiopulmonary resuscitation and are probably of no clinical consequence. Indeed, fat embolism occurs in some 90% of individuals with severe skeletal injuries, but less than 10% of such patients have any clinical findings. Fat embolism syndrome is the term applied to the minority of patients who become symptomatic. It is characterized by pulmonary insufficiency, neurologic symptoms, anemia, and thrombocytopenia, and is fatal in about 5 to 15 percent of cases. Typically, one to three days after injury, there is a sudden onset of tachypnea, dyspnea, and tachycardia. Note, please, these clinical signs. Also, irritability and restlessness. They can progress to delirium or coma. Thrombocytopenia is attributed to platelet adhesion uh, to fat globules and subsequent aggregation or, or splenic sequestration. Anemia can result from similar red uh, aggregation. Um, and uh, or hemolysis. Also, we can find a diffuse petechial rash, 20% to half of cases, and they are related to rapid onset of thrombocytopenia and can be a useful diagnostic feature. Uh, the pathogenesis of fat emboli syndrome probably involves both mechanical obstruction and biochemical injury. Uh, fat microemboli and associated red cells and platelet aggregates can occlude the pulmonary and cerebral microvasculature. Release of, the of free fatty acids from the fat globules exacerbate the situation by causing local toxic injury to endothelium and platelet activation and granulocyte recruitment which uh, with free radical protease and acosanoid release, they complete the vascular assault because lipids are dissolved out of tissue preparations by the solvents uh, routinely used in paraffin embedding. The microscopic demonstration fat microglobules typically requires specialized techniques including frozen sections 
and stains for fat yes, with Sudan 3. Air and gas embolism. <clears throat> gas bubbles within the circulation can cause us to form frothy masses that obstruct vascular flow and cause distal ischemic injury. For example, a very small volume of air trapped in a coronary artery during bypass surgery or introduced into the cerebral circulation by neurosurgery is the sitting position. In the sitting position can occlude flow with dire consequences. A larger volume of air, generally more than 100 um, cubic centimeters, is necessary to produce a clinical effect in pulmonary circulation. Unless care is taken, this volume of air can be inadvertently introduced during obstetric or laparoscopic procedures, so as a consequence of chest wall injury. A particular form of gas embolism uh, called decompression sickness occurs when individuals experience sudden decreases in atmospheric pressure. Scuba and deep sea divers, underwater construction workers, and individuals in uh, unpressurized aircrafts in rapid ascent are all at risk. When air is breathed uh, at high pressure, for example, during a deep sea dive, um, increased amounts of gas, particularly nitrogen, are dissolved in the blood and tissues and the liver then ascend uh, in uh, sorry, the diver then ascends the pressurize too rapidly the nitrogen comes out of solution in the tissues and uh, the blood so solubility of gas is decreasing with the decrease of pressure as you may know that from physical uh, laws the rapid formation of gas bubbles within skeletal muscles and supporting tissues uh, in and about joints uh, is responsible for the painful condition called the bands. Uh, they were named in 1990s because it was noted that those uh, afflicted characteristically arced their backs um, in a manner reminiscent of the uh, then popular woman's fashion pose called the Grecian band. Um, in the lungs, gas bubbles uh, in the vasculature cause edema, hemorrhage and focal atelectasis or emphysema, leading to a form of respiratory distress called the chokes. A more uh, chronic form of a decompression sickness is called um, caisson disease, named for the pressurized vessels used in bridge construction. The uh, works in these vessels suffered both acute and chronic forms of decompression sickness. In Casson disease, persistence of gas emboli in the skeletal systems leads to the multiple foci or ischemic necrosis. For more common sites, at the femoral heads, tibia, and humeri. Individuals affected by acute decompression sickness are threatened by being placed in a chamber under sufficiently high pressure to force the gas bubbles back into solution. Subsequent slow decompression permits gradual resorption and exhalation of the gases, which prevents the obstructive bubbles from reforming. A very uh, severe outcome of the gas embolism does the gas embolism of the brain uh, capillaries. And you see here the gas bubble in the uh, capillary, the small vein, in fact, a uh, small vein uh, in the mm, cerebellum. The injury of endothelium may lead to the consequent petechia. The next point of our discussion that's the infarction. Um, an infarct is an area of ischemic necrosis caused by occlusion of either the arterial supply or the venous drainage. Um, arterial thrombosis or arterial embolism underlies the vast majority of infarctions. 
less common causes uh, of arterial obstruction leading to infarction include local vasospasm, hemorrhage into the arter arteriomatose plaque, or extrinsic vessel compression, for example, by tumors. Uh, morphologically, uh, infarcts are classified according to color and the presence of or absence of infection. They are either red, hemorrhagic, or white, anemic, or ischemic, and may be septic or blood. Red infarcts occur in case uh, then there is the venous occlusions, like in testicular torsion, or in case of the bad carry syndrome in the liver. In second cause, that's uh, loose spongy tissues, like in lungs, where blood can collect in the infarcted zone. And uh, uh, third cause of the red infarcts in tissue, uh, it could be formed in tissues with dual circulation, like in the lungs and small intestine, that allow blood to flow from an unobstructed parallel supply to a necrotic zone. Uh, the fourth, uh, fourth uh, reason of the red infarcts formation, that's the tissues previously congested by sluggish venous outflow. And fifth cause of red infections uh, that uh, uh, may occur in tissues, then flow is re-established to a site of previous arterial occlusion and necrosis of the case of uh, following angioplasty or um, of arterial obstruction bypass surgery. White infarcts uh, occur with uh, arterial occlusions in solid organs uh, with end arterial circulation like heart, spleen and kidney and where tissue density limits the seepage of blood from adjoining capillary beds into the necrotic area. As you may see, infarcts uh, tend to be wedge-shaped with the occluded vessel at the apex and the periphery of the organ forming the base. And the base is a serosal surface, there may be an overlying fibrinose exudate resulting from, uh, from an acute inflammatory response to mediators released from injured and necrotic cells. Fresh infarcts are poorly defined and slightly hemorrhagic, but over a few days the margins tend to become better uh, defined by a narrow rim of congestion attributable to inflammation. With further passage of time, the infarcts resulting from arterial occlusions in organ without a dual blood supply typically become progressively paler and more sharply defined. In comparison in the lungs, hemorrhagic infarcts are the rule. Extravasated red cells in hemorrhagic infarcts um, of phagocytose by macrophages, which convert hem iron into hemosiderine. Small amounts uh, do not grossly impart any appreciable color to the tissue, but extensive hemorrhage can leave a firm brown hemosiderine rich uh, um, residue. The dominant histologic characteristic of the um, infarction is ischemic coagulative necrosis. Importantly, if the vascular occlusion has occurred uh, shortly, minutes to hours before the death of the person, histologic changes may be absent. It takes 4 to 12 hours for the dead tissue to show microscopic evidence of frank necrosis. Acute inflammation is present along the margins um, of infarcts with a few hours and is usually well defined within one to two days. The 
Eventually, uh, the reparative response begins in the preserved margins, uh, in stable or um, labile tissues. Uh, that's the tissues with the different capacities of uh, proliferation the parenchymal cells. Mm, the parenchymal regeneration can occur at the periphery um, where underlying stromal architecture is preserved. However, most infarcts are ultimately replaced by scar. The brain is an exception to this generalization. In that central nervous system, infarction results in liquefactive necrosis. So, uh, resuming uh, the part with infarction, the key concepts, um, they are here. That's infarcts are areas of ischemic necrosis most commonly caused by arterial occlusion. Sometimes by venous outflow obstruction, which is less frequent cause, typically due to thrombosis or embolization. In fact, caused by venous occlusion or occurring in spongy tissues with dual blood supply and where blood can collect typically are hemorrhagic. Those caused by arterial occlusion in compact tissues typically are pale white. Whether or not vascular occlusion causes tissue infarction and influenced by collateral blood supplies, the rate at which an obstruction develops in intrinsic tissue susceptibility to ischemic injury and blood oxygenation. See, thus four factors uh, of the mm, infarction features, the infarction development. The next point of our discussion, that's the shock. Shock is a state in which diminished cardiac output or reduced effective circulating blood volume impairs tissue perfusion and leads to cellular hypoxia. hypoxia. Uh, at the outset, the cellular injury uh, is reversible. However, prolonged, prolonged shock eventually leads to irreversible tissue injury and is often fatal. Shock may complicate severe hemorrhage, extensive trauma or burns, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, and microbial sepsis. And causes fall into the three general categories. That's cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and shock associated with systemic uh, inflammation. Also, you see the uh, additional types that shock may occur in the setting of an anesthetic accident of spinal cord injury like neurogenic shock and uh, um, immunoglobulin E mediated hypersensitivity reaction, so called anaphylactic shock. In both of these forms of shock, active possibility is to hyperdendum tissue hyperperfusion. So, again, like in case of the shock which associated with the systemic inflammation, now you see the redistribution of blood caused by the you know, systemic vasodilation. So by the numbers, cardiogenic shock um, results from low cardiac output due to myocardial pump failure. This can be due to intrinsic myocardial damage. Um, Infarction, ventricular arrhythmias, uh, extrinsic compression, like in case of cardiac tamponade due to the rupture, as you remember, or outflow obstruction in case of pulmonary embolism. Hypovolemic shock results from low cardiac output due to low blood volume, such as, as can occur with massive hemorrhage or fluid loss from severe burns or diarrhea. And the uh, shock associated with the systemic inflammation may be triggered by a variety of insults, particularly microbial infections, burn trauma, and, for example, pancreatitis. The common pathogenic feature is a massive outpouring of inflammatory mediators from innate and adaptive immune cells that produce arterial vasodilation, systemic 
arterial vasodilation, hence vascular leakage and venous blood pooling. These cardiovascular abnormalities result in tissue hyperperfusion, cellular hypoxia, and metabolic derangements that lead to organ dysfunction and if severe and persistent organ failure and death. It should be noted that diverse triggers of shock, microbial and non-microbial, associated with inflammation produce a similar set of clinical findings which are referred to as systemic inflammatory response syndrome. The uh, morphology of shock uh, that's here the cellular and tissue changes induced by cardiogenic or hypovolemic shock are essentially those of hypoxic injury. Uh, changes can manifest in any tissue, though they are particularly evident in the kidneys, brain, heart, adrenals, and GIT. The adrenal changes in shock are those signal forms of stress. Essentially, there is a cortical uh, cell lipid depletion. This does not reflect adrenal exhaustion, but rather conversion of the relatively inactive vacuolated cells to metabolically active cells that utilize stored lipids for the synthesis of steroids. The kidneys typically exhibit acute tubular necrosis. Uh, see, and the uh, uh, centralization of blood flow with the red pyramids and pale cortex, that so-called shock kidneys. Uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, we can observe the fibrin-rich uh, microthrombi that also may lead to the petechial hemorrhages. Uh, the same thing we may find in the skin and the serosal surface. Um, this is the pathophysiology. Oh, okay, that's the next point. Um, in the lungs, in the lungs we may observe diffuse alveolar damage. Um, and uh, in the brain we may observe the, the small ischemic Mm, areas of brain tissue injury. With the exception of neuronal and myocyte uh, ischemic loss, virtually all of uh, tissues may revert to normal in the individual if the individual survives. Unfortunately, most patients with irreversible changes due to severe shock die before the tissues can recover. So, uh, shock as a state of systemic tissue, hyperperfusion due to reduced cardiac um, output and or reduced effective circulating blood volume. The major types of shock are cardiogenic, hypovolemic and distributive. Shock of any form can lead to hypoxic tissue injury if not corrected and septic shock, especially septic shock, is caused by the host response to bacterial, viral or fungal infections. We'll discuss about septic shock next semester in a proper topic. And the last point of our lecture today, that's uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, that's not a specific disease, but rather a complication of large number of conditions associated with systemic activation of thrombin. Disorders ranging from obstetric uh, complications to advanced malignancy uh, can be complicated by DIC, which leads to widespread formation of thrombi uh, in microcirculation. Uh, this microvascular thrombi can cause diffuse circulatory uh, insufficiency and organ dysfunctions, particularly in the brain, lungs, heart and kidneys. To complicate um, matters, the runaway thrombosis uses up platelets and uh, coagulation factors. 
that's uh, so-called consumptive coagulopathy, and often activates fibrinolytic mechanisms. Thus, symptoms initially related to thrombosis can evolve into a bleeding catastrophe, such as hemorrhagic stroke or hypervolemic shock. Yeah, I see, uh, uh, you may see. So, DSC, DSC, the possible consequences are twofold. First, there's widespread deposition of fibrin within the microcirculation. Um, this leads to ischemia um, of more vulnerable organs and the micro and hemolytic hemolytic anemia. which results from fragmentation of red cells as they squeeze through the narrowed microvasculature. You see the so-called uh, schisto, uh, schistocytes. Uh, schistocytes, that's the, um, in fact, fragmented RBCs which are regular shaped, jacked, and have two-pointed ends. And the second outcome, that's uh, consumption of platelets and clotting factors and the activation of plasminogen now leading to a hemorrhagic di uh, diathesis. Mm, the plasmin not only cleaves fibrin, but it also digests factors 5 and 8, thereby reducing the concentration further. In addition, fibrin, uh, fibrin degradation products resulting from fibrinolysis inhibit, in, inhibit platelet aggregation. Like a dimer formation. So morphologically, uh, thrombi, 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 thrombi. In case of disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, they are most often found in brain, heart, lungs, um, kidney, um, liver, spleen, adrenals, etc. Um, any tissue can be affected anyway. Affected kidneys may have small thrombi in the glomeruli that evoke only reactive swelling or endothelial cells, of endothelial cells, or in severe cases, microinfarcts of even bilateral renal cortical necrosis. Numerous fibrin thrombi may be found in alveolar capillaries, sometimes associated with the pulmonary edema and fibrin exudation, creating the hyaline membranes uh, reminiscent of acute respiratory distress syndrome. In the central nervous system, fibrin thrombi can cause microinfarcts, occasionally complicated by simultaneous hemorrhage, which can sometimes lead to variable neurologic signs and symptoms. The manifestation in the endocrine glands are of considerable interest. In meningococcemia, for example, fibrin thrown by within the microcirculation of adrenal cortex are the probable basis of the massive adrenal hemorrhage seen in Waterhouse Frederiksen syndrome. We will discuss about that next semester. An unusual, uh, unusual form of DIC occurs in association with uh, giant hemangiomas, Kassabach Merit syndrome, in which thrown by, thrown by from within the neoplasm because of stasis or recurrent trauma to uh, fragile blood vessels. You see uh, the uh, retiform purpura on uh, gross image. That's also the sign of the severe case of DIC with scattered hemorrhages and areas of skin necrosis and plasma region on the surface due to DIC caused by gram-negative sepsis in this case. That's so-called purpura fulminans, uh, very, very severe uh, outcome exacerbation of the DIC. Thank you for your attention and have a nice week. Don't forget to like and subscribe our video. Bye-bye.